In 1979, the Prime Minister of Dominica, Patrick John, was forced to resign, but the strangest group of people met to try and bring him back into power. As the Washington Times described, the coup forged some odd alliances. It united right-wing North Americans and Caribbean leftists, white nationalists and black revolutionaries, first world capitalists and third world socialists. This is because inside Dominica there was a sort of internal war against the Rastafarians known as the Dreads there. So as the Rastafarians were chased into the jungles, they began to plot to overthrow the government, and it's believed that they would help in this coup. While over in North America, neo-Nazis and Klansmen agreed to help John in coming back to power. They filled a boat with weapons and were prepared to set sail and capture the country. This means Rastafarians and Klansmen could well have been fighting on the same side. And among the neo-Nazis there was Don Black, the founder of Stormfront, David Duke, the Grand Wizard of the KKK, and allegedly some US politicians like Ron Paul, who were accused of knowing about the plot when it all ended in failure. In return for their help, John would have given these neo-Nazis a free hand in turning his country into a haven for casinos, drug dealing and the likes. This was Operation Red Dog, a neo-Nazi plot to turn a Caribbean island into their playground. But just before I move on I should bring up Atlas VPN as they are running a huge discount on their 3 year deal for just $1.39 per month. So check the links in the description to grab this deal. Atlas VPN was developed by top cybersecurity specialists and IT engineers. It is a tool that encrypts your data and hides your virtual location and your device is given a new IP and DNS address. So for all of you who are concerned about online security, this is for you. But for me, I'm currently living in Turkey and here some websites I use a lot are not available. This includes PayPal and even some movies on Netflix. So all I need to do is use this VPN and all of this is instantly available. But more than that, VPNs allow you to get better airline tickets and cheaper hotels as the rates in each country are different. Also Atlas VPN has a data breach scanner which will notify you every time your password or other data of yours has been breached. And as I've said, Atlas VPN is running a huge discount on their 3 year deal for just $1.39 per month. This deal however won't last long, so make sure you check it out by clicking the link in the video description below. All of you can do this as Atlas VPN is supported on any device, plus given their 30 day money back guarantee, there's no real risk in giving it a go and seeing if it's for you. So Dominica achieved their independence in 1978, but it was an incredibly poor island after years of depending on cash crops which were constantly dropping in value. Patrick John was the leader of Dominica during their independence movement as he was the premier beforehand. But during his time as premier, John turned his attention to persecuting the growing Rastafarian community in his country, which he labelled as a cult. To do so he passed the Dread Act, which banned anyone from having dreadlocks and those who kept them could be arrested without a warrant and some were even killed. Rastafarianism had reached Dominica largely via the middle class students who travelled abroad and then it filtered down into the working classes and, at least in John's eyes, there was some rationale in persecuting the community. This is because the Rastafarians broke off from the society at large, they made their money by, as you'd expect, growing marijuana. But Dominica is a small mountainous country with scarce farmland. So there were some clashes between farmers and the Rastafarians in the south of the island. Plus, as some of their members advocated violent action in the name of black power, there were reports of tourists also being attacked by them. This led to guidebooks warning against people visiting the country, and a drop in the number of tourists again hurt the economy because it depended on it so much. In the words of John, we Dominicans have never known ourselves as a violent people, and the new trend in our society is without doubt the handiwork of a few degenerate leaders who see themselves as the architects of a new society, projecting new standards, cultures unacceptable to the majority of Dominican people. So the Dread Act was passed, Rastafarians were rounded up in prisons, many of them forcibly had their hair cut, and as I mentioned before, some of them were even killed. While those who weren't and who wished to maintain their dreads in way of life retreated deep into the forests. Between 1975 and 1981, there were a few gun battles between the police and the Rastafarians, which left a number of people dead. This however was largely welcomed in Dominica, 
as it helped John win the election of 1975. But Dominica was quickly becoming home to a number of strange people and even stranger alliances. Sidney Burnett Elaine, for instance, was given the right to build an airport hotel and even an oil refinery. But he was a known gunrunner and was working alongside apartheid South Africa. So Dominica was aiding the South African government by illegally supplying them with oil and the likes, bypassing international sanctions. But more than that, Sydney would later plan to overthrow the government of Barbados, but he was caught in Martinique. And in an interview, he later admitted that he had millions of dollars and planned to overthrow the governments of both Barbados and Dominica with the aid of the South African government. But how much the South Africans were really involved, it's hard to say, as Sydney himself is a complete mystery. There are some reports that he had connections with the IRA, further involvement in coups and uprisings across the Caribbean, and a lot more. As for John, he continued to make money by selling off land to foreign businesses, one of which was Don Pearson, a Texan businessman and founder of many pirate radio stations off the coast of England. But also, one of his major ambitions was to create free ports in Caribbean countries like Haiti and Dominica. So eventually, the Dominicans turned on John and he was forced to resign in 1979. Then life became worse for the people, as huge hurricanes left thousands without homes and unemployed. Eugenia Charles, a more right-wing politician, was elected in the aftermath, but she, like all Caribbean leaders, ruled in what seemed like a sort of Wild West. For instance, ever since the Cuban Revolution removed the Mafia from their country, they had been searching for a new island to call home. The Bahamas had proved to be a popular spot, but Mafia money seems to have been funding political movements around the region. Otherwise, various socialist groups were gaining in popularity, while there were also more right-wing leaders like Eugenia Charles, who in fact would later support the American invasion of Grenada. So there were right-wing leaders fighting the socialists, different sorts of black power groups across the islands, American companies, and a great deal more. But the Caribbean has always attracted these varied groups. After all, going back throughout history, there were pirates, runaway slave communities, banana republics, and private American citizens have sporadically popped up hoping to annex a couple islands for themselves. These private American citizens, by the way, are called filibusters, and they would often look to expand into Central America and the Caribbean throughout the 19th and even early 20th century. Some fought for the fruit companies during the Banana Wars, while others, like William Walker, were successful in taking over Nicaragua, albeit very temporarily. Otherwise, Southern Americans in particular hoped to take a few Caribbean islands and bring them into the United States in order to increase the number of slave states in the Senate. The most famous group was the Knights of the Golden Circle, who were sort of confederates before the Confederacy. And their planned nation, the Golden Circle, planned to unite the entire Caribbean region with the southern states. These southerners would go on to support Narcisco Lopez, a Venezuelan supporter of slavery, in his failed attempt to seize Spanish Cuba. So, going back to the 19th century, right-wing Americans looked for opportunities in the Caribbean, something that would be repeated in the 1980s. Anyway, back in the 20th century, in early 1981 in Dominica, there was a coup attempt against Eugenia Charles. This was completely unrelated to the Klansmen in the USA and was launched by Frederick Newton, the head of the Dominican Defense Force. Although Charles stayed in power, she now had a disloyal military, an ongoing war with the Dreads, and internationally, strained relations with her neighbors. As a right-wing leader, she was worried about the left-wing coup in nearby Grenada, which removed Eric Gehry. And Gary, by the way, was a very strange leader. He was accused of fixing a Miss World competition that he was a judge for, plus he had a fascination with UFOs. In fact, he once brought scientists to the UN to give a speech on the topic, and he largely clung onto power thanks to his private militia known as the Mongoose Gang, which often beat opponents with sticks. However, he was toppled back in 1979 by Maurice Bishop, who, as a socialist, established good relations with Cuba and the likes. So, the Klansmen and neo-Nazis therefore looked to topple this new socialist government of Grenada, but with Cuban aid and a reasonably large army, this proved to be too much of a leap. So, they looked elsewhere and settled on Dominica, which only had a defense force of around 100 people and a number of anti-government groups. Therefore, Michael Perdue and Wolfgang Droger entered into talks with Patrick John, and began to plan for their invasion. Perdue was a former marine who had been kicked out of the army, but began to embellish stories of his war heroics, while Wolfgang was a German-born Canadian neo-Nazi 
who would later set up the group Heritage Front. These two got support from David Duke, the Grand Wizard of the KKK, who provided them with names of potential soldiers for their mercenary army. Then they needed to gather arms and finances. To do so, they set up a company called Nautic Enterprises, which was a front to collect funds from across North America. In the end, they collected a number of shotguns and assault rifles, and thousands of rounds of ammunition. But the number of men involved in the invasion would just be over a dozen or so, and they'd be divided into three teams. One team was tasked with seizing the police station, another team would take the prison, and the third would take smaller installations around the capital. They would then gain the support of the defense force, kill Eugenia, and reinstall John back in power. Now this may seem like far too few people to take over an entire country, and you'd be right. This is when the dreads come back into play, because it is widely believed that Algernon Maffey, one of the leaders of the dreads, had some ties with Purdue, and would rise up during the invasion. After the plot was foiled, Maffey was put on trial and confessed to this, but earlier in the year, after the first failed coup, there was an increase in clashes between the dreads and government forces, and a number of people were killed. So it is believed that Maffey may have confessed to involvement in the plot in order to get off other charges. However, and again, this is all speculation, but their involvement does make some degree of sense. After all, they made their money from the drug trade, something the neo-Nazis wanted to essentially base the country's economy on. Plus, they hated the government, and a lot of them were being killed. So, a Nazi Rastafarian alliance wasn't out of the question, but it's again very dubious. Otherwise, some in the Dominican Defense Force, like Captain Malcolm Reed, was involved in the plot and wanted to bring back John into power. While over in America, there are a number of people who have been accused of knowing about the plot. This includes Texas Governor John Connolly, and more famously, Ron Paul. Now, accusing Ron Paul of knowing about this plot could have been a ploy by the neo-Nazis during their trial. But, looking at Paul, there may be some truth to it. This is because he has been pictured with Don Black, and there are further connections between Ron Paul and these people. But, I must stress, this is all just speculative, and it could well all mean nothing, so I'll leave it there. Anyway, in Dominica, Eugenia Charles was made aware of the plot, and arrested John in March 1981, and then she declared martial law. So, during that year's carnival, the bands had to stop playing at 8pm, and this just worsened tensions with the dreads. However, the Americans still pushed forward with the invasion the following month. In late April, Purdue was about to set sail from Baton Rouge with a dozen or so men. But, they never got onto the boat. This is because they approached a former soldier, Michael S. Howell, to borrow his vessel, but he quickly just alerted the authorities. So, the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco and Firearms had been following the men for the previous year, and some even infiltrated the group. So, just before the men were about to board, the authorities sprung their trap and caught them all red-handed, armed to the teeth, and with a Nazi flag they hoped to fly on their ship. Ten men were put on trial, and all of them were found guilty of violating the Neutrality Act. So, they were sentenced to three years in prison, which, all things considered, seems incredibly short. One of the plotters, Don Black, apparently took programming courses in prison, which he put to use on his release when he created the Stormfront website. While over in Dominica, Patrick John was sentenced to 12 years for treason, but he only served five years, and on his release, he got involved with his country's football association. So, as you'd probably expect, he was one of the many people who took bribes from the Qataris back in 2011. Therefore, the plot to take over Dominica and turn it into a drug haven for neo-Nazis ended in failure. It was in fact mocked by the press who dubbed it the Bayo of Pigs. But, there was a Bayo of Pigs too, just five years later. This time, a group of would-be mercenaries looked to overthrow the government of Suriname, which was then Marxist. And, according to the plotters, they received money from Dutch banks. After all, the country used to be a Dutch colony. But again, this could well just be complete fiction. And this leaves me with the question today. Can you think of any other strange attempts to overthrow a country or invade? Leave them in the comments below.